winning a developer's trust is so freaking hard and losing their their trust is so freaking easy <laughs> yeah hi everyone you're listening to scaling dev tools i'm joined today by zena rocha who is the founder of reset and also the creator of react email and dracula theme in vs code which has its own wikipedia page and you've probably used <laughs> Zeno, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Jack, for having me. I'm really excited to talk about DevTools and everything between. Uh, I think it's going to be fun. Yeah. Um, so Resend has been kind of like taking over Twitter a little bit recently. Um, could you tell us a bit about Resend? Yeah. So Resend is an email API for developers. And the whole idea behind Resend was how can we create the stripe of email or the cell of email? That's, that was the thought process as we were getting started. And yeah, we, we started only a year ago, uh, but we're seeing a lot of traction. And uh, the whole point is building a product that has exceptional developer experience, right? So that was the premise since day one. So that's what we've been focusing on. And it's been, yeah, really nice so far. We're a small team of six people. We're all distributed. We have some folks here in the U.S. We have some folks uh, down in Brazil. And yeah, it's been pretty cool. This episode is brought to you by WorkOS. At some point, you're going to land a big customer and they're going to ask you for enterprise features. That's where WorkOS comes in because they give you these features out of the box features like skin provisioning, SAML authentication, and audit logs. They have an easy to use API and they're trusted by big dev tools like Vercel as well as smaller, fast growing dev tools like Knock. So if you're looking to cross the enterprise chasm and make yourself enterprise ready, check out WorkOS. We've also done an episode with Michael, the founder of WorkOS, where he shares a lot of tips around crossing the enterprise chasm, landing your first enterprise deals, and making sure that you're ready for them. Thanks, WorkOS, for sponsoring the podcast, and back to the show. And it's interesting, you know, when you say, like, that developer experience, um, it feels like all these, you know, these things that you've built are kind of related and, like, maybe, are like, one leads to the other. Um, React email is like a really popular way to create emails in React. And although maybe it's not like exactly the same as Resend, it's like the credibility you got from building. So, so could you tell, talk to us a little bit about how these kind of like play together? Yeah, no, that, that's a fascinating story because when we started, it was just Boo and I, right? So we were like, struggling with different email vendors we're like ah oh, we were using postmark at work we were both working at work os before and we're like oh man this is so this is so hard to use and we're having trouble with emails going to spam and then we saw that postmark was acquired we're like oh no like most of the times when services get acquired like you can see the quality going downhill after that so, and that was the, the last one that we liked. We saw that happening with SendGrid, with MailJet and MailGun, like all these services started around 2008, 2009, and they all have been acquired by now. So we're like, you know what? Let's, let's try to do that exercise of like creating the stripe of email, how that looked like. So Boo and I just started playing around with this. And this was just like for fun, no big idea company behind it right so just playing around and then we got like pretty far in the mvp and then we're like oh this is interesting okay now it's working then we started sending to a couple of friends and then they started integrating in production and we're like no 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 don't do that like we don't have tests we don't have like a api status page we, we don't have anything right but they're like no but this is way better than what i have now i want to use it and the day we got the first um, paying user that like I saw that this friend was using and then I sent him like a Stripe payment link and then he paid, I'm like, oh, 
there's something here. This is actually useful. But what was interesting about that was even though we're building recent, we're like, what's the story that we're telling to the world? And are we just going to come out of nowhere and say, hey, here's a new email API? Like, what's the angle? What's the connection? What's What's there? And we, by that point, we're talking to a lot of friends and a lot of like people that we knew. And we're just trying to understand like how, like what's the process of sending an email? And it typically started with a designer, maybe doing this super complex email template on Figma, or maybe not that complex, but just like an email template on Figma. They hand off to the developer. And then that developer now needs to convert that from Figma to code. And they quickly realize that, oh, doing this with HTML and CSS is not the same as I'm used to with the web, right? Like it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's so like, hard. It's like hieroglyphics like, when you look at it. Yeah. <laughs> it's insane, insanely hard because it, it feels like you're coding for the web in 1995, right? Yeah. Like you need tables, you don't have border radius on, on Outlook still, like so it's very much like an archaic effort and and then but they they have to do it somehow right like now you have this code that is super hacky and then you now need to start testing so then you need to send real emails to real inboxes and that's also a pain and then you think about like okay now i need to send this to real users i need somehow a mechanism maybe a smtp service or an API that I can trigger. And then after that, there's the, all the observability on top of it. Like, oh, was the email really sent or not? Was it delivered? Maybe it bounced. Maybe someone marked as spam. So we understood that journey of like from the designer to the moment that the email lands on the inbox. And we we're like, we need something better because there's so much pain here in the beginning. Uh, and the stack for building emails is not the stack that we use for the web. Like what's the stack that I love using, right? And this is like just me as an individual developer. I love React. I love Next. I love Tailwind. So I wish I could have those things when I'm building my email. And that's what we started developing. So we were like, you know, let's pause resend. And we kind of like, we did both things together. We didn't really pause, but we're like, let's start building React email, which is going to be this library of unstyled components built for email. And we are heavily inspired by Radix. We, are, uh, we were both working at WorkOS. We loved using Radix as individual developers too. And we're like, yeah, this is going to be a compatibility layer where if you want a button, this button will render the same on Yahoo Mail, on Outlook, on Apple Mail, and Gmail. And you don't need to worry about all those hacks. And then we released that in December. And then only in January, we even mentioned that recent existed. So the storyline was, hey, here's a tool to help you build the email. And we were giving you that for free. It's open source. Here it is. And then you build the email using that. Awesome. What's the next step after you built? Now you need to send. Here's an API you to send and react email you can use with aws you can use with all of our competitors but it works really well with recent so it's a strategy that's no different than what Purcell did with next.js and the actual Purcell platform uh, is this duo of here's a framework for you that's open source and free and available for everybody works everywhere and here's a SaaS that complements, and that's how we're actually going to make money and pay our salaries in our team, right? Like we need those two forcing functions working together. When you lay it out like that, it's like, it's so, it's, it seems amazing. And it's like a, just such a incredible um, strategy. And what, what I think is interesting is like that it sounds so obvious now when you look back like the it's it's just wild that people were like couldn't write emails you know in the way that they write like their web page it's like it doesn't make any sense 
now, but like, <laughs> I think that was a reality for like a really long time and no one really came along and actually addressed that. I, I feel like this, was it this kind of, this feels like so like straightforward how it kind of came about. Mm-hmm. Was it like, I'm sure there was some like challenges along the way in that journey there. So many challenges and I, I feel like there's something about, uh, that mental motto of like, what's the story that I want to tell to the world? And then you manifest that story throughout your strategy, right? Yeah. So I feel like people just go straight to coding, straight to like, oh, let me just solve the problem without really thinking like, yeah, but what's the, like, who's the hero? Like who, what's yeah. the challenge? Like, what is the status quo? And how you put those things together in a way when people see it is coherent and it makes sense and the dots are connected and there, there's a lot of challenges to put that together and make that a reality because in the beginning that was a bet. So the bet was maybe people will like to use react for their email templates. Maybe they will, and maybe they some some won't like maybe there are teams that prefer to use a drag and drop thing in DUI and they don't want to have the engineers involved. But maybe there are some teams that, you know, they have like all the email templates inside their source code. They love having the history. And so we put that bat out in the world. And then we are like, let's see how it plays out. And for us, it it's very much I, I, tr- I really believe this and I learned this through another open source project that I have called Clipboard.js. So Clipboard.js, <clears throat> I think it has 30,000 stars on GitHub right now. Super big, right? Huge. And we got like the first 10,000 in the, the first like one week or two, something very, like it was very mm-hmm. short. This was back in 2015. We launched in the same year as React as... Or, or maybe it wasn't real. Like I can send you the links for this, but like there's Swift launch in the same year. And the top 10 launches of that year on GitHub were all for like Microsoft, Apple, uh, Google. And then we're exactly. there. So like, yeah. Like just like my name in, in this repo. And a lot of people were asking like, oh, how did you get so many stars in such a short amount of time? And like all this attention. And what what happened with that specific open source library was I spent two weeks building that before I launched. And only like three days were in the actual source code of the library. And the rest w- was all in the documentation page and on the website. So I really wanted like a very nice readme and a very nice website. And when you go to the website, and you can go now if you want, you'll see that it's extremely simple. There's n- there's nothing, like it's no big deal. Like you go there, it's like super simple. But I wanted to make sure that it f- like the flow was good, that the tagline was impactful, that the first intro was like, it explained the why. And I wanted to make sure we started with the why. And then the first demo is very like familiar. So we do like the GitHub input with the copy, which, you know, like you would, you do that for copying the GitHub, uh, Git URL to clone the repo. So like very, like things that are, are very simple, but I, I, I feel like most developers, they spend most of their time doing the source code and not thinking about how they're going to distribute and market and, and teach people how to do it. Whereas like you should maybe do like 50, 50, you know, like, or maybe 80, 20, even that's how, how, how insane, insanely important it is. If you want to stand out nowadays, it's so hard to stand out. So if you just do the bare minimum, like, oh, I pushed to GitHub. Yeah. Anyone can do that, but who can do like a readme that really flows well, that makes sense, that it's exciting. You want to share with your friends. When I start using it at your company, at your open source, at your side project on a Saturday afternoon, I feel like many people miss that. That is, yeah, this, this is like amazing. Um, so what does it look like, uh, the kind of 
actual reality of you doing that? So is it like you push up, like you finish the source code and you've just got like readme.md at the top, or are you like working on it as you go? Like, what is your process there? You need something to be able to teach it, right? So I think it starts with the actual functionality. And we all, we all have like the same amount of hours, you know, like in when I'm doing these side projects, you know, I'm doing like I have a two year old daughter and, and I have a wife and I need like a, I have a life. Right. So I don't have too much time like everybody else. Like we're all squeezing like a few minutes here and there, a few hours here and there. So it's not like you need to spend more hours on the whole thing. It's more about how do I decrease the scope of whatever I'm doing so that it's very straightforward, only the essential, and then I can free up time to really dive into how can I explain this and how can I do it in a way that it, it's not a blo- like a wall of text, you know, it's there's actually like, it's compelling. Like you're like, oh yeah, okay, this problem makes sense. And then you see... Uh, Step by step, and that step by step also makes sense. And there are migration guides, and there's a change log. You're like, okay, yeah, this looks maintained. And there are examples, and there are visual examples, not only just the code. And now you have to guess it. Um, and those trends they change all the time. Like, I can't use that same README that I that I did in 2015 and think and think that yeah, that's what's going to convert today. Like, no, like what people are expecting is different now. They want a banner on top. They, you need the badges and they, they need to be a line in the center. And like, there's just like, you need a, a mascot or like whatever it is. Right. Um, but like noticing those patterns, uh, I think it's important and it's all related in that process of like, okay, I have like the bare minimum. How do I teach the bare minimum in a way that is actually compelling? How do you know if it's like doing a good job at it? Like, do you have a process to, to do that? I wish I could say that, uh, oh, here's the magic formula. formula. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Zeta, we need the magic formula. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody wants, right? If you got an ebook, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's all about repetition. That's the reality. Like you do one open source project and it completely fails. No one pays attention. You spend all this time and no one cares. And then three months later, you do another one. And then maybe 10 people care. And then you're like, oh, why did 10 10 people care? Like, what's different about this one that I didn't do in the last one? And you do that many times. You know, like my first open source project I created in 2011. So... You know, I've been around, I've seen things, I've, I've, I've seen what works, what doesn't, right? Um, so it's not like you will get that all right on the first try. And there's a lot of things that we got wrong with React email, even though I've been doing open source for all for like 13 years now. So uh, you need to be constantly learning. You are going to make mistakes and there's no formula. But if you are consistent about those improvements that you're making, consistent about thinking about distribution alongside maintainability and and, and brand, um, then I think I feel like that's that's the key. The the consistency part is is more important than like one trick that I can give you in January 2024 that three months from now won't work anymore. Center your badge. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's like kind of the best and worst response in a sense that it's like, it's the worst because we kind of, ever, we're always looking for like, uh, if I just do this, but then I guess it's the best that it's like, it's okay. Like if we build things, no one cares. Like it's just that process of uh, doing more of it. Um, the thing that you mentioned as well at the beginning was about descoping. Um, I suspect maybe the answer is going to be similar, but I just wondered how you think about like what needs to be there versus what doesn't need to be there. Man, I feel like the, the heart 
of a, a really good product is like relies on a severe prioritization process and severe like descoping process. Because especially for us, right? Like <clears throat> we we're very much similar to what Linear is doing in the sense that here's an existing tool that everybody uses, in their case, Jira. It's not nice. Everybody hates it. There are all these memes about like how slow it is and how bad it is. But still there and we still use it. And then Linear comes in. 15 years later, after Jira is like a beast, dominates the market. And they say, oh, here's a product, right? And you can, you can taste, you can feel the attention to detail. It's just so good that you, you can't help yourself but wanting to use like, and share and like propose to your team and maybe don't even accept a job offer if the company doesn't use Linear. And Linear is not inventing anything new. Issue tracking exists for a long time. They're just like looking at this problem from a different angle. We're very much doing the same where SandGrid exists, Mailgun exists, and we all don't like them. They feel slow. The support is bad. Deliverability is not great. And, but that's the tools that we're used to. But then we come in as recent and say, Hey, here's something new. There's attention to detail. This is a product that's created for you and if we just try to compete in terms of like features we're going to be so behind like we'll never get there we don't we're not we can't scale as as they can because they've been doing this for 15 years now so the only way to have a product that has a quality bar that is very high is again gscope because the trade-offs that you're going to do is like, okay, this needs to feel much better than what's out there. Not just like one or two times better. It needs to feel like 10 times better. But man, like we, I, I have a, a burn rate for the company. Like I, I raised this money and I, I can't spend it all. Like it's not like I can hire all these engineers. I can't. I have like very limited resources as a small team. So how can I take the most out of it? And if I want to meet that quality bar, I can't spend six months working on a project. So I got a T-scope. So we do that a lot. We think that a lot about like, what's, what's the V0? What's the, the, it's not even like an MVP. Like what's the V0? And then from there, we're like, okay, now we got to meet this quality bar. And holding that bar, is extremely hard because the moment you you tell a teammate that yeah this is good enough you know this is fine from that point on now you're setting the bar here and now the whole team will know that oh i just need to get to this bar like i like it's not like it's here now it's here and then next week someone shows something and you're like okay we're ready to ship this feature and it's maybe a little bit lower and you say, okay, it's fine. It's ready to, to go to production. And then once again, so over the years, your product starts feeling just like all the other ones, right? So holding that bar high is extremely difficult uh, on the day to day. It requires a lot of discipline and a lot of saying no, a lot of going back to the drawing board and thinking, is this, are, are we proud? Does this reflect what we, what we believe? And sometimes the answer is no. And then we go back. There are times with our website that we are ready to launch. And then we are like, oh man, it's not there yet. And then we delay one week. And then we worked on all these things. And we're like, it's not there yet. We delay another week. Okay, we feel good. Now it's like, I'm proud. Like I want to show this to my mom. Like. This is so cool. I want to tweet about it. Like, yes, I'm proud. Okay, now now it's time to ship. How, how does it like look like those kind of conversations? Or like if I if I'm on your team and I 
you know, just like create a pull request. Okay, Zeno, I think like hopefully this closes that ticket and you're just like, you know, maybe it does do most of it, but how, how does that kind of conversation kind of go? Yeah, we operate very much in a way where everybody does a little bit of that thing. So there are a lot of times that I might start a pull request with the the worst possible code and I might just open a draft and then someone on the team that has way more time and way more context on the code base might jump in, make it way better. And then the designer will come and then jump in and do way better. And that's the same for the blog posts. Like every blog post we do, I might, like someone might start the first draft and then I might jump in just to do the formatting. And then someone comes in and like tweaks a little bit more and we're like, okay, now we're ready to ship. Mm. So it's less about, oh, this is bad. Here are the 10, the 10 things why this is bad. It's like, oh, I recognize like some 10 opportunities to improve. Let me add them to the commit myself. Mm. Let me, let me show what greatness looks like from my point of view. And then someone on the team might critique that and they say, no, what you did is actually not good. And you got to hire people that share the same values because otherwise they won't get it. They'll be like, ah, man, this guy again, you know, like asking all these changes versus yeah. Like if we do that, that would be so much better. That's true. But let's do it. You know, like be willing to delete the code you wrote or add more or, or remove stuff from like descoping because like, yeah, if we descope, then we can highlight this better and spend more time showing the value of this other thing. I feel like there's a lot of interesting things when you do that. You know, a lot of things come up from that. Yeah. So you just have to have everyone on the same page around it and everyone's kind of looking for that bar. So it's not like you're bad. It's like everyone in the team is looking to raise it. So you yep. would like, it's done when no one can raise it more or less. Or is it like Exactly. And when, when the goal of the team is like, we're not trying to raise the bar only for ourselves, but for the whole industry. Yeah then that's really hard. Uh, it's like, okay, we wrote a blog post. Is Guillermo Rauch going to read that and share on Vercel's internal Slack saying, look how awesome this blog post is? Yeah. Right? And if, he, and if we feel like that's not going to be the case, okay, then we don't, like, let, let's think about how we can get there. Or like, let's do something that is so cool that other companies will try to copy you. So we see, we just saw yesterday, there's a, a new YC company that is like copying our landing page in a way that is so crazy. And then you click on the docs and it's like the same docs. And we're like, wow, this is like, uh, you know, they just like, they did a fax or like wh whatever, like it looks the same, right? And we're like, yeah, that's fine. You know, like th that success. Because that means that people recognize that there's something interesting there. And now, like, they're trying to replicate that. Uh, and then that makes it our job way harder because now we're like, okay, now how can we make this even better? So you're always chasing that perfection, which you'll never get there. Uh, it's impossible, right? But you got to keep chasing. Otherwise, you're just going to ship crap. Uh, and that's going to be, if that's something that you care, if that's a value that you hold, then you're not being true to yourself. And, but if, it, if that's not a value that you hold, that's fine too, right? If you're entering a new market, there's no existing players, there's no consolidated winner, that's, maybe you don't need to do that strategy. But if you're in a crowded market, a lot of options, and here you are trying to stand out, it's going to be really hard if you don't do some of these things. Yeah, because you're not competing on like, we do this different thing. 
you because you're not doing something different you're doing something better so yeah if you were just trying to like get most of the features of sendgrid then everyone's just going to stay with sendgrid and it's not about features right yeah like you can fill all those boxes but I feel like the way developers make decisions nowadays is that they want they want to use products that reflect what they care and for some people they care about design they care about things looking good and they care about clicking in a button and responding in 20 milliseconds versus two seconds and they would rather use that product versus the other so i feel like there's this exercise of like trying to understand who you're building that thing for and then reverse engineer what they care and put that into your product, into your brand, into what you're selling, right? Yeah, that's, um, it's, it's an amazing uh, approach. It makes so much sense. So you're basically building something that's really great and significantly better than the, the kind of like existing players. And people are buying into not just what your product does, but maybe like, how it makes you feel. It's like, like I, I feel like a lot of what Apple got, the success they had is because of like Steve Jobs and like the design and the way that you know that like they spend so much time thinking about everything and that they're trusting Resend is going to also think very deeply about how this API is designed. How is that the kind of... Yeah, for sure. And at the end of the day, like if our emails go to spam, right? Like it's all for nothing. Like the core of what we do is still there. Deliverability, sending emails. It needs to be fast. It needs to arrive in the primary inbox. And it's almost like a hierarchy of needs. Like you need that base. You need that foundation. Good and solid. You need security and you need data integrity. And then... And then you can start thinking about usability, ergonomics of your API, SDKs, and and that attention to detail, that like ability to surprise people when they're performing an action. There's a lot of things that we we put together to communicate that without saying any words. Right? Like you go to recent.com. There's this crazy Rubik's cube on the right side. And you're like, what? What is this? Right? Like why there's this floating WebGL object here? And the reason why it's there, it's because it communicates that, hey, we care about the details. We care about technical excellence. We care about like modern tooling. And we could write all that down in a mission or values page, or we can demonstrate it in the most important real estate in the web that we have for us, our website in the first loading screen. There's, there's no place more important than that. Everybody's going to look into that. So that communicates something. Uh, when we had our wait list and we, we, we stayed in a wait list for like three or four months, the only way to get to the wait list is if you clicked something in your keyboard. You couldn't just... If you press, you couldn't just go with, with your mouse and click. You had to like press a key, a key. And that communicates that, hey, as a developer, I know you care about navigating with your keyboard and using keyboard shortcuts. I get it. I'm just like you. So this is for you. This is a product for you. And again, we could articulate that or we can just demonstrate it. And that's what we try to do over and over again. Show that, hey. We care about this, just like we think you care about this, right? And sometimes we get it right, sometimes we get it wrong. And you're, you're always experimenting with those little things to see what resonates with folks. Yeah, this is, um, this is amazing. Show, don't tell. Which for developers, right? Like, show me the code. You know, yeah. like, that's, that's it. Show me the code. That's a mantra that, that every single developer knows. So you've got to double down on, on, on the things that we, we know they care, that we care if you're building something for Europe. 
for that you you belong in that audience, right? You yeah. gotta look into yourself, the things that you you care and say like, yeah, like there are things that I'm not super proud of. I'm like, ah, oh, I wish this was better. Damn, as a developer, I don't like this. Okay, we gotta get better. Yeah, and because this is the re the resend story is like that's the story you're telling and and, and living. I feel like that's the <laughs> That's the thing I'm taking away from this is you have this story, but you're living this story as well. And then people believe your story because you're living the story. Exactly. Man, that's so true because like, yeah, like you can just write it down or you can, uh, I also feel like people buy from people, not from companies. So even though we spend a lot of energy working to improve the recent brand just like what you mentioned just now about like oh people buy from apple because of you know they think steve jobs they think about this human they elon musk either you hate it or 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 love him doesn't matter but people they they bought teslas three years ago because of him um i do feel like if you are a if you're listening and you're a founder creating a dev tools, you've got to think about how does your personal brand mix with your company brand and how you can show the things that you care with those two brands because they, they are all mixed in. Uh, and if your personal brand communicates something that is completely different than like, for example, we have the recent website. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It shows that we care about design. And then you go to my personal website and it's super shitty, full of like outdated stuff. And you're like, wow, this is terrible, right? Uh, okay. Like there's definitely a disconnect. And now I'm like, do I even trust recent in a way? Because maybe they just hired this freelance designer to do this website but when i sign up the dashboard will look terrible and the api will look terrible and everything will be will look terrible or no this is actually very consistent like i across the board i can tell that they care about the details okay interesting now that's something i can trust in the long term like winning a developer's trust is so freaking hard and losing their their trust is so freaking easy. <laughs> it's incredibly easy. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, I was going to ask you at the end if you had takeaways, but I think that was the takeaway, right? <laughs> For sure, man. For sure. Like you, the the thing that I uh, I'll leave folks with is like if you. Like you got to think about all the little things that you're, for me, that's what developer experience is the sum of all the details. So you go to the website, you're like, oh, this looks cool. And then you scroll down, you see a code block. Oh, nice. Like I can see SDKs for the languages I love. Nice. Then you go to the docs. You're like, okay, there's like some structure. There's some guides for beginners, but also content for advanced folks. And then you start using, and it's very quick to send that first API call. Nice. Okay. That's something I like. That's something I, I want to invest in. And you play around on a Sunday afternoon and you can get something, an MVP working. And you're like, okay, now Monday morning, I can tell my coworkers, like, this is cool. The opposite is also true where you go to the website. It's like a little bit janky. You go to the docs. You're like, wow, this is so, like, I can't really understand what's happening. You try the first API call, you got an error. You try the second one, there's an error. And then you go to the docs, there's a typo. You're like, I don't trust this brand. I come. And maybe six months later, you're going to give another chance. If you keep hearing about it on Twitter, you're like, oh yeah, like everybody still like them. Okay, let me check it out again. But you've got to think as like climbing that stair. Or because like the the worst thing you can have is a brand that not like that people hate it. That's not the worst thing that can happen for a brand is a brand that no one cares. 
that is just sitting there and like, yeah, no one really, no one is passionate about it. No one uh, hates it as well. It's just sitting there. So think about what you're building and how can you do something that really stands out. Otherwise, you're just going to sit on that cemetery of all these other dev tools that someone had a great idea, but they couldn't manifest in terms of all the other things you need to do to make it successful. That's a really great roundup, Zeno. Um, are there any shout outs that you want to make? Um, no, man, just you fixing <laughs> this together, you know, like I feel like it takes so much energy to, to build, like to, to make these things happen. And as, as we were talking just before we started this, like it's a Friday evening for you right now. Most of the people are like in a pub, uh, and you're here. So thanks for, for putting this together. And also for everybody who listened until now, you know, like, I hope you got something away from this. And if there's any questions you have, you want to chat, feel free to, to reach out to me. I'm always open to you know, helping folks. My time is very limited nowadays because of recent <laughs> and Dracula and all this. And your two-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> and my two-year-old. Uh, but I'm always willing to help. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming, uh, Zeno. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. And thanks for the nice words there. Um, goodbye. <laughs> See ya.